This podcast is made with the support of New Zealand On Air. A warning. This series features strong language and themes of sexual abuse, as well as explicitly sexual material and mention of suicide. Please take care. Episode 2. Ange. We were coming up to now as a place that I have not been to in 30 years. It's almost like a different world when you drive through here. Every couple of years, I'll stay up all night sometimes. It's just a manic obsession to just try and find every skerrick of him on the internet yeah, to see same. if he is um, active in a youth group again. Yeah. If he was active somehow in with youth or children, then I would contact the people and, and let them know. What are your reasons for doing this? Why, why do you want to do it? For the next generation of kids. I think because of my age at the time, 14, that I just didn't have a strong reaction to it like I would now. <laughs> I'm sitting in a hotel room in Auckland with a woman called Ange. We're talking about what happened to Ange's best friend, Jane, at a church youth group when they were teenagers. Ange has flown to New Zealand to speak about this for the first time in 30 years. You know, and I did lie for them. My job was to protect them. Um, And so I did, and it's to my huge regret. I think that there's a lot more awareness of this kind of thing, but not enough um, of this particular type. Because that's so complex, isn't it? It it just makes, it's um, a head fuck, really. And it gets, I think the head fuck gets worse as you get older. I'm Noelle McCarthy, and this is Dear Jane, a series about what happened between a young girl and her church youth group leader when she was a teenager, and how the effects of that experience are still reverberating in her life decades on. I've known Jane since we were in kindergarten together. Um, we So we went to kindergarten and then primary school right through to um, Form 2 and then went, yeah, so just been friends forever. When Jane first said she wanted to make a podcast about what happened to her at youth group when she was a teenager, I asked her if there was anyone we could talk to who would verify her story. Ange was the first name she said. And you live in Australia now? Yeah, I do, yeah. When did you move over there? 21, when I was 21, yeah. Finished uni and just um, decided to travel, yeah, but didn't get very far. (laughs) You got across the ditch. Yeah. (laughs) We first met on a Zoom call. I really wanted to reach out to Jane, but I never do because I thought... This is extremely triggering and I don't know what's going on in her life right now. She might be just about to start a new job. She, she might have just got pregnant. She's just had a baby. Whatever it is, I, I don't want to ring her up right now. I just hope and trust that she will contact me when she's ready. Ange and Jane stayed friends throughout their time in the youth group, but started to grow distant as Jane's relationship with Dan continued. Jane had become consumed by him really and she'd become very legalistic very serious very sad really when I think about her you know um just not laughing so much anymore um over analyzing things in the similar sort of way that he he did uh uh just very worried about you know listening to non-christian music or you You'll allow yourself to slip if you expose yourself to these particular kinds of environments, you know. And she was also just, yeah, very unhappy, I'd say. By the time she was sort of 16, 17, yeah, she was kind of really a shell of what she had been. And we, we drifted apart. In the last episode, Jane spoke about how, over time, her relationship with Dan became widely known in her church community. 
and remembers being excited for Jane when she first got together with Dan. But her reservations deepened, even as the pair began to be accepted by everyone else. Later on, when I was older and adult, you know, you, your feelings change and you look back and, and, you th- and I think, you know, I really think that that was wrong, what happened. At the time, it was more... Um, kind of, oh, they're still together, you know, they're still together at sort of 17. So, you know, it was it was right kind of thing. But, you know, I think that's where the flawed thinking is, that if they stay together, it was right. Ange and I are in reception when Jane arrives at the hotel. It's been nearly a decade since they've sat down together, just the two of them. The plan today is to spend the afternoon driving around the eastern suburbs of Auckland, checking out some of Jane and Ange's old haunts, putting their memories side by side. We're in Jane's trusty white people mover. Jane and Ange are up front. Me and Te Ahe, our sound recordist, are sitting in the back. When was the last time you went to... We're bleeping out the name of the church Jane and Ange used to go to. I suppose that you, with your parents... And the name of the suburb it's in. You probably go past the church. I do, I do, and I get very emotional about it. Yeah. Very emotional. Sometimes I stop the car out the front, and yeah, really? you know, like I, and I do, like I do want to egg it. Yeah. You can't help warming to Ange, the way she brings humour even to the heavy stuff, and I can see how it changes Jane. She seems lighter. It's like being with her best friend feels like being part of a team again. At this point, Jane's still dead set on having a meeting with Dan, and she wants to be ready if the meeting happens. Connecting with Ange is the first step for her in unpacking memories she hasn't gone near for 30 years. You know, like there's so much, I just shelved everything. I yeah, just, you sh- did. I just yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. shelved everything, basically pretended it didn't yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah. That's so fucked up. It is. It is. So every uh, just every couple of years, I'll stay up all night. Sometimes mm. it's just a manic obsession to just try and and find every scarec of him on the internet yeah, to see same. if he is um, active in a youth group again. Yeah, because I think oh well, I didn't want to tell the story until you were ready to tell it. Yeah, but if he was active somehow in with youth um, or children, then I would contact the people and and let them know because you know so like a so yeah something I did every year or two yeah from the start we've talked about Jane having the option of laying a formal complaint against Dan she was a minor in a sexual relationship but her feelings about this are still complicated it's never been black and white for her maybe that's why it's cast such a long shadow over her life certainly And if I found out that he had done this to anyone else, I would feel compelled to go to the police. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't feel that in my situation as it stands right now. Yes. We drive along Mission Bay, past dog walkers and women pushing strollers along by the water. It's a beautiful summer's day. In the front, Jane and Ange are catching up talking about people and places they haven't thought about in years. Uh, we lived yeah. in this village. We hung out, we'd meet at the library. We'd meet friends mm. friends from school out at the library. Yeah. Um, um, play cards and then go and get some chips, hot yeah. chips and eat them down here. All this is in primary school. Yeah. yeah. This is So where this fancy restaurant is now, it used to be the, the dairy. dairy. <laughs> yeah. And you'd, you'd go in and with your, with your um, one and two cent coins and get what you could yeah. and one and two cent lollies. God, um, we're old. I know. <laughs> I remember when burger rings were 30 cents packet. I remember, yeah, I remember one cent lollies. Ange and Jane were 13 years old when they joined the church youth group. I want to know more about what kind of friends they were back in 1992. How close were they? And we, <laughs> we would talk on the phone, um, you know, constantly, we'd write letters to each other constantly about, you know, did you hear so-and-so got with this person and this person's going around with this person now and I'm pretty sure that they kissed with tongue and all of, yeah. that, <laughs> all of that kind of thing. You know, when you had your first kiss, 
I yes. timed it. Yes. So yes. that I could give you the result of yeah. how long it was 36 yeah. and seconds. And I knew you were going to do it, so I yeah. tried to really make it last. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so, you know, we um, we went we went with ex- extremely questionable motives <laughs> yes. along to the youth group, but we made friends. But also very age-appropriate motives. Yeah. And yeah. it was fun, right? So yeah. we went, we started for the social, we got caught yeah. up, and, and every Friday night was a both social and learning occasion. So you'd turn yes. up, we'd be in the rumpus room of, yeah. of someone's house. Yeah. So Hang it, on, so was it always a private house you'd go to? It like was at a, the beginning. It was at the beginning and it was one particular private house yeah. of a family that wasn't even in the church. No. So I, I don't know why or how it ended. It, they ended up offering their house. I think just because they had the room and they were kind. All of this seems strange to me, that you just go along to a church group at a random residential address. But I grew up in the Catholic Church, which is ritualised and quite formal, and which has had, in fairness, plenty of issues of its own with predatory behaviour from adults towards children and young people. At the age of 13, Jane and Ange didn't question any of the setup around the youth group. This was 30 years ago, and kids were more free range then. It was just a great way to, to be, you know, very social, and I yeah. loved. I, I, I was in theatre sports at the time at school and it just recently occurred to me that kind of that philosophy is rubbed off on the on my life or maybe I was attracted to it because of the philosophy of yes and. Yeah. You were like, do you want to come to youth group? Yes, and let's go to a camp as well. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. And what because was... we had each other and you and I were so tight, like we just mm. all, you know, anything that was scary was less scary. And when I say scary, I mean yeah. exciting scary. Yep. You know, something for the first time was made less scary yeah. because we had each other. Listening to Jane and Ange in the front seat, laughing away, it strikes me how easy they are with each other, like no time has passed. When we asked Ange about coming over to do this interview, she had a plane ticket booked within the hour. She shifted work, childcare, all her commitments at short notice. Jane's story with Dan is complicated, layered with questions of guilt and responsibility. But Ange's loyalty is straightforward. And we had alter egos. We did. Who would Who were two older women that we would slip into character to discuss things if we wanted to discuss things from a different perspective? Stop it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Marg and Mal. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, one of us would just start doing it if we wanted to slip yeah. into that kind of. And what were these? Um, like, um, oh my! Isn't it just terrible how those. Um, they haven't tidied up all those old poles out there sticking in the ocean. Now I just think it would look so much cleaner and crisper if they just, like what are they doing these days? And what is these bike lanes about? I mean, I don't understand it when I come to an intersection. Someone's going to get hurt, aren't they, oh. now? Oh my goodness, Mark, I don't know. Who, it's the young people. It's the young people. I don't know what they're doing. They were boomers. <laughs> they were boomers, essentially. <laughs> As Ange explains, in that first year of joining the youth group, going away together was a big part of the appeal. There was four camps every year that we regularly went to that were associated with with our particular um, church. Um, And they would, um, you know, they'd they'd do a testimony where someone would, uh, a, a leader would stand up and tell an emotional story, maybe that they'd taken drugs and, um, them were saved by the Lord or they were saved from a from a medical condition or something you know something that would bring tears and emotion then they would play very stirring music You know, and people would put their hands in the air, and um, so you know that sort of uh, light feeling that you get from meditating and the emotion. And then it'd say if you feel called, so they sort of break you into this place where you might be crying, that sort of thing. So you form these very tight bonds yeah. um, with people very quickly because mm. of that state mm. that they put you in. Um, and then um, you know you. You've, you want to keep seeing those people, you want to keep those bonds up, so you keep going to youth group, you start going to church. As Jane described in the last episode, it was at one of these church youth group camps that Dan first told her he had feelings for her, 
in the Coromandel the summer before she turned 14. I asked Ange what she remembers about that time. I certainly, it was certainly out of the blue, certainly a surprise. Um, But I think because of my age... um, Are you older or younger than Jane? I'm the same age, age, same age as Jane. Um, I think because of my age at the time, 14, um, that I just didn't have a strong reaction to it like I would now (laughs) you know it was just I was kind of always just that sort of personality where it's like oh okay this is happening now um but yeah a little bit probably just just a bit confused I guess yeah Dan was the main the head leader the organizer and he was the most serious one and very pious you know wanting to really explore all the details of the bible in terms of what does you know what does this mean in in great detail um was that part of what you did at youth camp anyway was there or at youth group was there a lot absolutely yeah a lot of bible studies and um in particular from dan Quite a quite a very serious line about following the Bible and um, uh, that you know anyone compromising anyone lukewarm in their faith or lukewarm following the Bible you know was an insult to God. Mm. So you would is it fair to say he was a very staunch Christian? Incredibly, yes. I would say yes, yes. And and moral. Like, or, or talked about morality a lot? How would you describe? Just, I think he just spent a lot of time talking and I can only imagine also thinking about everything being either right or wrong. Yes. Black and white. Black and white. Yeah, black and white thinking. And how did that go down with, with you all? Uh, we really followed it. You know, I've just been looking through my diaries and I'm surprised at how much we followed it. I'm just right. You know, I was just writing down all, all these things. Um, like what? What uh, sort of stuff? Like sort of verses um, about um, God rejecting, you know, spitting you out of his mouth if you're, if you're not, um, you know, neither hot nor cold but lukewarm and Dan was a big follower of a Christian musician called Keith Green and um, so there's a lot of lyrics from Keith Green in my school diaries as well. That was, um, you know, a very, the big main message, there was no compromise. Jane's relationship with Dan developed over the summer of 1993. By now, Jane and Dan were a couple, and Ange was the only one who knew. I felt special because I was in on a secret. Um, And uh, he, from the get-go, he was full of praise for me. You know, um, you're a huge supporter of us. You know, you're going to be the bridesmaid at our wedding and you're going to be the godmother to our children and because, you know, you've been such a support to us and we'll tell them, you know, how we got together because of your support, which was at that time, I guess, the support was keeping their secret. Yeah. Easter was in early April that year and the group went away on another camp in Hanua this time. At this Easter camp... That first Easter after Jane turned 14, he had secured himself a separate room. There was, so there was sort of, you know, girls' bunk rooms and boys' bunk rooms in a line. And then he'd secured himself a separate room away from all that, which was actually the medical room. I can't remember what excuse he'd used to get it. So I went in there with Jane and him and I took photos of them. Um, on the, on the bed with him cuddling her. And then I remember Jane and I, there was a bag of jelly beans. I remember Jane and I making a heart shape out of jelly beans on the bed. And then I left them to have some alone time. But that was all unbeknownst to anyone else um, and certainly a secret from the other leaders at the camp um, that he had her in that room. It would have, during the day, 
you know, um, as far as I was aware, was just, yeah, during the day, some time in there. Angie's brought photos with her from Australia, from that camp in 1993. There's one of her and Jane sitting together. They're both 14. <laughs> they look very young. <laughs> Tell me about how the relationship developed. You know, you were the only person who knew about yes, it. Yes, at long that time. stage. Yes, yeah. that's right. At some stage, and I'm going to say maybe it was six months in, but really it could have, it might have been three months, it might have been 12. It's hard to remember time, but they started telling a few more people, also bound to secrecy. So it kind of went, it felt like a special club, you know, like the inner group of youth group. Yeah. And what yeah. would you tell them? I don't know because I wasn't involved. Because you knew yeah. already. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, yeah, he, to he told them that um, he and Jane were, t you know, together. But at this stage, he's still leading. He's still head leader of the youth group. In 1993, the man we're calling Dan contributed to the church's annual report on behalf of the youth group leaders. Jane's sister, Lisa, was also one of the leaders that year. He describes a very positive and unifying camp in Coromandel at the start of the year. That's the camp where he told 13-year-old Jane he had feelings for her. And amidst talk of camps and Friday night study, there's a sentence that leaps out. Quite simply, our prayer is that the devil may no longer be able to hurt the members or the leaders of our youth group. And then there's the last paragraph of his report. It has been a challenging year. We've experienced real fatigue, living up to people's expectations, living lives that are acceptable in the eyes of those who are sometimes quick to condemn seems so often a waste of energy when all we and others looking at us should be concerned with is a passionate desire to please the Lord. Reading this, I remember what Ange said about Dan being very black and white about morality, about religion. I think about the year he wrote this report, about Jane on the cusp of turning 14 in the summer of 1993, learning about Dan's feelings for her. And then where we're coming up to now is a place that I have not been to in 30 years. Back in the car with Jane and Ange, we're driving to a place neither of them has spoken about since 1993. It's almost like a different world when you drive through here. Ugh. So where are we? Um, we are at a reserve called Dingle Dell. I'm just going to find a park. I feel like there used to be a little parking thing here. Was there or was it always like this? No, it was always like this, wasn't it? What's going on, Ange? I can't just, oh, so many things I want to say and then I just, um, I I'm want you to grasp them. Ange told me about Dingle Dell in our first Zoom, about what happened there and how she thinks it's affected her friendship with Jane. And now, here they are, three decades on. Standing here on the grass, it's really lovely, peaceful, and the name, Dingle Dell, it's like something from a fairy story. This was a really fun place to come when we were little because there's lots of little bush walks. Um, lots of little bush walks. It's kind of, you feel like you're stepping into a different place because you're in a very lovely suburban area, quite highly populated, and then, and then there's this reserve, which, yeah, just tra immediately transports you to nature. I mean, you can hear the cicadas. You can hear the trees rustling. It's like, it's a beautiful spot. So what's this bringing up for you? How often did you come here? Was it just the one time? I can only remember the one time specifically, mm. but I, I, I couldn't say with certainty it was only one time. And I think I can remember the one time specifically because what happened was um, something I hadn't experienced before, and so it was new and shocking. Did he, do you remember um, how he came to bring you here, or you know why? Well, we used to just go around in the car yeah. because that was how we could spend time alone, right? So it wasn't nighttime, it was daytime. Oh, right. it was daytime? Yeah, like late afternoon. I think, you know, I think, again, maybe I'm being generous, but I feel like we came down here for, to, to, 
to sit sit in nature and have have a cuddle and just talk. You know, it was a place where we were unlikely to probably be seen by anyone. Um, and if we were, we weren't in someone's house, we were out in public. So it was, it was just, you know, and then uh, and we would have started kissing and so on. And then, um, and then he never got his penis out, right? Like, like I was just rubbing it and rubbing against him, and then he ejaculated. And I remember being like, oh, there's something grimy about that that he's just like, we've come here and he's just come in his pants. And like, you could see it on his jeans. I mean, I can remember his, the jeans he was wearing. And I remember being like, this is like, I know, I think it was, I think it was, must have been one of the first times that we'd gotten that kind of physical and perhaps the first time yeah. that he came. Yeah. And I was so inexperienced yeah. in all things sexual that I didn't, I'd, I'd never known how these things play out in real life. And so I thought people ejaculated inside other people. I didn't think it was something that just happened because you could touch it a bit from the outside. <laughs> so it was a real shock. Yeah. And then I felt dirty and guilty and gross and all of those things. Yeah. And then, and then it was done. Then it was, yeah. you know, then it was like, oh God, we've got to get out of here. Yeah, right. It wasn't. There wasn't a, a conversation about what I'd just experienced or anything. This was a formative sexual experience for Jane when she was 14 years old. Looking back now, she can understand a bit better the layers of complexity in how she felt. I don't know if you've ever been, Ange, in the situation where something happens that, like, you feel part of you is, like, grossed out by, but it's also exciting. Like, it's, we it's a weird yeah, duality. Yeah, yeah. Every, I mean, there's always mixed emotions to everything, isn't there? But that's definitely a common one. Yeah, so, you know, and that's part of why um, years, years and years later I still felt complicit because I was mm. trying to reconcile the fact that I probably physically and emotionally enjoyed some of these things while also feeling that's like the, it wasn't right. That's, the, that's one of the really difficult parts. The girls stayed close after that, but both agree their friendship changed after Jane told Ange about what happened in Dingle Dell. Normally, you know, as you said, as we were saying before, it would be like, oh, I patched the guy, blah, 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 tell me everything, and we would dissect it, and where did your tongue go, and who, who, who were you, and do that. Like, for weeks, that we would dissect these kind of things. But with this, I didn't want to. So I was probably quite muted with my response. And I don't think I wanted to necessarily hear too much more. So yeah, I was, I didn't really know what to think or make of it. Um, so I think I just put it away. Yeah, I think, um There was something about sharing things with you in that way that you spoke of before that was fun and age appropriate when we were talking about, and probably even when I first kissed him, you know, mm. it was probably all exciting, you know, they've had mm. their first kiss. Um, but when things took this turn, I think I probably came to you for you, that, and if you, if you were to get excited by it in the way that we had done previously, it would relieve me from the weirdness. Mm. But you didn't. No. And then suddenly this became something that was a bit darker mm. and must be kept secret. We get back in the car. Ange is still processing what Jane said. I want to mention that it's affected, this, um, the situation with you and Dan has impacted my life now and also the way what I teach my kids. So I t taught my kids from the t 
time they could learning to speak from two, three years old about nefarious intentions of adults that could be people that love you. Right. Um, and to the point where one day I was telling my daughter about it and she went, Mum, you've told me so many times. And I just, yeah. And I, I still don't know if that's good or bad, but it's just, it's sad. Next time on Dear Jane. Bigger secrets. And after you had sex for the first time, did you talk about it? Not about the sex, just about that it was really bad and we shouldn't have done it and that we'll never do it again. As Dan gains the trust of the people closest to Jane. He seemed nice enough. He seemed like a, you know, a church boy. Um, What's a church boy? <laughs> well, clean cut and, you know says and does the right things to you, you know, is polite. You know, I, didn't, I don't remember ever thinking that he was impolite or rude or, you know, and, and that makes it worse because I'm trusting him because he's like that. Perhaps if he wasn't like that, I wouldn't have trusted him. series brings up any issues for you. There is help available 24-7 on Helpline. Free call or text 1737. And for more resources, you can visit the show notes for this episode of Dear Jane. Dear Jane is a spin-off podcast network production written and produced by me, Noelle McCarthy. Thank you to everyone who spoke to us for this series. Our producer is Madeline Walker. Our executive producer is Toby Manhire. Story consultants are Alex Casey and John Daniel. Our sound recordist is Tay Ihe Butler. Additional studio recording by Samuel Robinson. Our sound design and mix is by Mark Chesterman. Our original theme music is by Tay Ihe Butler. Our graphic designers are Tina Tiller and Archie Banal. Our voice actors are Liv Tennant and Tom Clark. And special thanks to Kirsty Johnston for guidance on trauma-informed reporting. This series was made possible by support from New Zealand On Air.